And then in 2007, he became the director of development engineering, responsible for Umbria products in development and coordinated partnerships with those in the UK, France, Italy, and Spain during the development of the Embraer aircraft. And since 2015, Ms. Ferreira has been the Senior Vice President of Engineering and Technology. He is also the President of the National Association of Research and Development of Innovation Companies. The title of the 2018 ICAST Daniel and Florence Guggenheim Memorial Award is Product Development Challenges in the Commercial Airplane Market. Mr. Ferrara, I invite you to come to the podium. Point, he decided to design uh, the 
14 bits, the number 14 bits, because 14 was his 14th value. It was intended to use this balloon to lift its leg. This was his first idea. So he decided to. That's why 14 bits, 14 twice. And he flew um, in Paris, as everyone knows. Dr. Susan, you mentioned that there will be a section to this long time discussion about who invented their plane. I have a final answer for that, but I can only share with you the next conference. So <laughs> we're all invited. But once oh, I had a friend from the United States who we were discussing about this uh, subject. One thing that he told me, that I believe it's the most important, in addition to being an inspiration to everyone, Santos Dumont flew in Paris, where Paris was the center of the world at that time. So more than inventing the airplane, he invented the aviation. He's the father of aviation. By flying Paris, he called attraction and interest people that would invest uh, in aviation. So no question about uh, this. And uh, in the next section of long time analysis, I did I'll give you the final answer to uh, the first slide. And the other that there is the very because it's incredible how he progressed in their design and his design. The demoiselle. And his name was, it was, he believed the was so gracious, so graceful, so light. So this is, young lady would be the best translation to, to English, that's the name he, he gave. He intended to have a mass production, mass given that time. But this his intention was that I'm trying to produce something that we can produce and people can fly. And was powered, I believe the last version was powered with an engine of 30 horsepower. And his cruising speed was, I believe, were not 50 knots. So it was amazing progress in, in, from the 14 bits. That was amazing to play. And that was, this is the inspiration Brazilians have to devote to aeronautics and science and engineering. So another injustice is because between uh, Santos Dumont and 1942 we have other initiatives in Brazil, many others, including Muniz and the M1235. But let's start with this Paulistinha in 1942. Uh, was designed by a group led by a professor from the Sao Paulo University. And in this Companhia Aeronáutica Paulista, and Paulistinha is our Volkswagen uh, in Brazil in terms of uh, airplanes. Okay. I mean, most of the pilots start their training in, in Paulistinha. It was even used as a trainer in the Brazilian Air Force. And, and, and it is still flying, the people are still in, you know, learning to fly and all these changes. And the second one is the Brazilian Air Force needed something, let's say, more advanced for training. So they, they decided to order this uh, North American Texan, the T6, to be uh, manufactured in Lagoa Santa, this is the great Belo Horizonte area. <laughs> and another attempt, another order to bring the aeronautical industry to Brazil failed. Difficulties in the commercial difficulties, production difficulties, so there is now a minimum role of the Brazilian Air Force. It's no longer a factory. 
Uh, after the Second World War, um, many, uh, many engineers from Europe came to Brazil, and I'll tell about this uh, later on. But one of them designed this, uh, our first, uh, first helicopter. It was just a prototype, it was the first helicopter designed in Brazil. It's a beige flora. How many birds? It's, uh, it's a nice, uh, it was very challenging at that time. Another order from the in fact, it was the Air Force. There was another trainer uh, from Aerotech in the 60s. Uh, we have some of them in the Air Force using it for training. They are replaced by the next one, what is T-25, uh, designed by uh, another European that came to the zoo. Was, the design was led by Kovacs, Joseph Kovacs was led, led this um, design of this airplane. It was manufactured by a legal, which became the Germanus subsidiary of the Embraer. Many attempts many initiatives that never flourished. But we were still keeping and trying to produce and design our plays in Brazil. What was really missing? How to break this act? This is a, a picture of uh, Casimiro Montenegro, Brazilian, from the Brazilian Air Force that decided to invest and the three fundamental points to have uh, uh, aeronautical industry in Brazil. He gave us at least the hammer. So his vision uh, was to create first education and research. So in 1949, the CTA, the Technical Aerospace Center in San Jose de los Campos, was created right after the Engineering College, the ITA, uh, with a great connection with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the brains and professors. After the Second World War, we could find even in Europe, we, many, many from Europe, including Jean-Marie Battelle, uh, Give lessons in the ITA. So, a technical center, a good education, and a place to keep the engineers, the research center. This is the wind tunnel, I believe. Yes. So, a center, education, and a center to keep the engineers investing, developing develop newer planes or science or whatever it is. So this was really a national strategic project that founded the base for the Brazilian industry. Some Europeans that came uh, after the Second World War to contribute with the Brazilian aerospace and aeronautical engineering. Professor Vandelli, Joseph Kovacs, Kovacs was designer, was led the design of the T-25. And then Mr. Falk, that, that, um, Henry Falk, that designed the uh, helicopter I mentioned before. And, um, a French engineer, Max Holt, that integrated the team and the engineer team that designed the Bandurante. He was invited by Osiris Silva to join the team to design the first Bandurante. So the second pillar the industry. So also, also together with this as a part of this national strategic plan. Let's let's uh, invest in education, 
invest in a research and development center, but we need an industry. We need orders, we need to make it real. And then, in the 1965, Embraer was founded by Joseph Silva under an order to manufacture the Bandeirant, to complete the Bandeirant development and manufacturing as an order of the Brazilian Air Force. This is the picture that I like, it's a copyright with Mauro Kerr, but I like it very much because, and the third point <coughs> that is, was important for Embraer and the Brazilian Aeronautical Industry was the timing. This is the right, you see the Bandeirante cockpit, I'm seeing analog, and clocks and everything. And on the left side, the Legacy 500 completely integrated the computers and full fly by wire. So, technical hurdle today is different. I believe that Bandeirante, technologically speaking, is, uh, was closer to the 14Bs. Then the legacy 500. <laughs> Cables, everything analog, open loop. Okay, the manufacturing process was quite simple. At that time, it was not necessary to invest very much in tooling. So it was feasible. I can see that we developed a from the beginning and aeronautical industry in Brazil today with this huge hurdle, technological hurdle, and, and because this is completely different. Timing, timing is, uh, was really, and is really relevant. Many others are, are, are trying to, 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 today, to develop newer planes and face huge difficulties because the technological hurdle is completely different. So from, from that point we moved with Bandeirantes, all Air Force or Brazil government orders. Bandeirantes, the Chavante, which is an air marquee, three to six that we assemble here for for training pilots that we received in behind. So it was an advanced trainer plane. The Panemas and also an order from uh, our government is a base to a uh, agricultural airplane. And the Seneca also the Piper Seneca, we made it under New Zealand order. Other versions of Ipanema. The Xingu was our first attempt to make a pressurized Canadian airplane. It was a derivative from the Bandeirante. It was at that time a really big step. It was sold to the French Air Force. And other versions of the Bandarant. So the company was growing and establishing as its industrial base uh, under Air Force and government orders. The same for another trainer, the Tucano, that would replace uh, the T20. Five. This is in the T27. Our first airplane certified as a Part 25 in Brazil, pressurized. The other packs, this was in 83. Was our first Part 25, and the first Part 25 damage tolerant in the world. This is a blade. So another. Uh, Air Force Order, the AMAX, 
that's called Fighter, that we developed together with the, the incorporation with the Italy and Mac. Uh, what's really important, consolidate our industrial capacity and other incorporate other technologies to the company. And then the Brazil was a very good play, but its life was really short because the market evolved too fast. You see that it was entering to service in 83 or 84. And by the late 80s, the market was demanding other kind of, of aircraft. So we decide to develop something to replace the Bandeirante, was the CBA. CBA is a consortium Brazil-Argentina, and the Surais, the Pusher, the very nice airplane, just 19 passengers, was not what the market was demanding at that time. And in our industry, a failure like that, yeah, it's hard. It's hard to survive. And Breck was technically bankrupt at that time, end of the day. Uh, 80s was really alive because the state owned company owned it. And um, so, difficult times. The CBA was important to evolve in certain technologies that we use it in the next product, very important, but was a complete, market-wise, was a complete failure. We, we even didn't complete its certification. And combined with this world global recession at that time, and there was a financial crisis, crisis as I mentioned, the industry suffering many mergers in variation. So we decided, and then Osiris, Osiris at that time, I believe, was our minister of, or was it at Petrobras? I don't remember exactly, but he came there, maybe to found in Brea for the second time and he conducted the privatization. So the state aborts some capital and the investors decide uh, to invest in bread. This, is, this man is Maurice Botelli, our first CEO that conducted the privatization and the bread. The market at the time, the commuter market, we're, we're looking for, due to the scope clause in the US, that is, maybe our market, a 50-seater and a turbo fan, not a turbo prop. So we designed the 145. This was uh, the airplane that is a real turning point for us. We designed the 145 with a minimum to design it has been created a new model of uh, risk sharing to many partners because uh, in the air and the investors they don't have all the capital necessary to invest in this airplane. <coughs> and we are running after the competition, we're late in the process, so time was really relevant with the combination of partners in Europe, Spain, United States, and is also important that is a Belgium, part of the fuselage, and is the first Embraer landing gear, the main landing gear, the first landing gear designed and produced uh, in Brazil for this. The main landing gear is this uh, Embraer landing gear, our division of uh, equipment. So we finished this certification by 96 uh, and it was really a success in terms of uh, selling to the US comply with the scope clause 
was uh, what you call back to base, so we, we used it as much as possible everything that we did in Brazil and CBA. At least that was our intention at that time. The cockpit was uh, the same, I believe the cross section remains the same, and the rest is completely new as every time we decide to use the old design. But we explored and exploit the 145 with all those versions. That's, that's the 145, we, we shortened it in a 135, we, we made uh, defense and surveillance airplanes in a 145 platform, and we made a, something in between the 145 and 135, that's 140, and uh, trying to and let's see, couple with the scope clouds we had at that time. And we even did our first step in business aviation with a platform at 135, which is a legacy 650. Legacy 650 is a 135 converted, if you will, in a business jet. So we exploit as much as possible this platform. Mm -hmm. Uh, recovering the company, the financial uh, help of the company was brought back by, back by this program. So when you, it was when you decide to develop new families of our play. So we need something bigger. The market was demanding in the commuter regional jets. Uh, bigger planes, as the 737 and, and were growing as well. So we designed this family, 170, 175, uh, 190, 195, which from the 70 to 115 packs. Um, another airplane in a business aviation, which is the lineage, which is a derivative of uh, the 190. So it's a conversion of the 190 to a uh, business jet. And at that point, we decide really to deserve the diversify and step in the business aviation. So we start develop uh, from scratch business jets. You see the final 100. We start from very small airplanes, final 100, which is a six arcs to final 300, which is a really small airplane as well. The Legacy 500 is a brand new airplane with the new technologies. We step in the full fly-by-wire control on this airplane and the Legacy 450, which is a derivative. So, a lot of new airplanes and new platforms and a lot of investment in that decade. Most of them from scratch. 117, 75 is the derivative, 190 is, uh, I would say, a large investment, new engines, new uh, wings. Phenom, Legacy. A lot of new platforms in so few years. It was help us perfecting our process, develop newer planes, perfecting and the team work, the team building, the processes and everything. It was a lot of investment. And finally, the ones that, that we are developing today. The first which was already certified, but we have the KC, again, um, Brazilian Air Force order. So it was designed under the Brazilian Air Force specification. And we're completing the of this into a new generation of the e-jets 
with the enhanced performers and new engines, new generation engines, new generation aerodynamics and wind. So by, by doing that, what I have today, from maybe the one in 50 years, most mostly in the last 30 years, I would say, a global presence in terms of operation. We have operations in the US, we have operations uh, in Europe and Portugal, we have commercial um, centers in many places, we have even engineering in the US. Um, and we have engineering in Belo Horizonte, which is a great cultural step. More than under their line as a cost of commercial aviation. Uh, more than a thousand airplanes delivered in business aviation to more than 70 countries. And in defense of security, more than 50 countries served by our airplanes or systems. And what is really important to call your attention, which is, as the Daniel mentioned and Dr. Susan mentioned, that our global cooperation, that we believe it's really uh, the basics are relevant and we need to intensify in the group. And I like this picture again. We keep investing in people, as Casimir did in the 1950s. So this is the most relevant aspect for our company and for our engineering. We have special programs uh, in, for engineers tailored to the environment needs in cooperation with the ITA that has been, been running for 15 years or, or even more. And most of the engineers from then, uh, of our member had, they, they go through this program. That's the way we hire people, engineers, today. Uh, in preparation, not only aeronautical, because we don't have many aeronautical colleges in Brazil, but also to understand the Embraer environment and create since the beginning that, that cultural aspect, which is, I believe, the most relevant in any industry activity. So given that, the final part of this presentation, let's talk about a little bit um, the challenge, the future, I like this pole voting picture because uh, the game starts when you select the height of the bar. And, and this is, I believe, the, the meaning I'm trying to give with this picture. We need to select the height of the bar and perform well. So, our journey. How will they travel around the future? They look quite happy with this vehicle, but then how will they travel around the future? Or not? So we have um, many aspects raising that bar. The world gets highly populated. This is really relevant. The, the world population has grown almost three times since I was born. It can seem that I'm becoming an old man as well, <laughs> for sure, but this is really relevant. This is low, I have never seen this is low of growth in our history. 
the world is accelerate maybe. Unpredictable as any time. It was never predictable. But it remains unpredictable. Limited in terms of resource, all those aspects are raising that bar. Connected is the two pictures of Paul Bentos, the city, and Francisco. You see the difference. The left people, they are really paying attention to the Pope. The right ones are just taking pictures to see the Pope. Insecure. And claiming for sustainability. So those are the main aspects uh, that are raising the bar from the future. But to have uh, we are also perfecting our pool. And we have some technologies that will help us to solve the problems that uh, we are facing in the future world. The first one is all this data science that's growing, recently growing. As data science, they mean our ability to sense the sensors are becoming more and more accurate and affordable. So we're sensing everywhere. Not only sensing, we're also transmitting that data and learning to storage a big amount of data and process. So, sensing in real time and processing is what we call Internet of Things. Processing a large amount of data, extracting some information, valuable information, is what we call big data. Uh, and teaching machines to not only follow or predetermine algorithm and logic, but learn and teaching them to analyze data and make choices and decisions is something that we're looking for and we call artificial intelligence. So all, all this combination, including Internet of Things, is something that it's perfect in our poll. In fact, Internet of Things, there are planes. Even commercial planes have Internet of Things for decades. Okay, we have re in many cases real time, time information and processing. This is Internet of Things. In the air management control, the processing by the guys that are controlling the traffic, but they are processing something. One day we will replace them by an app. <coughs> Jesus. Um, the second one is material. We are investing in design material from its molecular construction, which will enable us, if we succeed, to a much more efficient material once we can make them in a production scale. New source of energy and a way to storage energy. This is something also relevant that is perfecting our two. This can be a huge impact in not only in the science but uh, in geopolitics and economics. And the advanced aerodynamics are perfecting the way we can simulate in the aerodynamics. All this combined could allow us, let's say, to select the position of our bar. Maybe for short hauls, 
to have them quieter and more efficient than playing with the combination of uh, hybrid or electric or whatever. This is a possible position to put in our part. Or maybe we'll bring this guy down with this uh, hyperloop, which is a flying machine in a very high altitude, maybe controlled, but high, low, low pressure and everything. It's a flying machine. It's not using the air, uh, static pressure, dynamic pressure for lift, but it's a flying machine. Or maybe you can make it so smart, integrated in data science that anyone, or maybe no one, will fly it. Another possible position to put the bar. Can you make it affordable one day? Is it really a business case? That, that's the intent of this bearings. We have a different bearing with something that could be very niche market. So is it really um, a business case? We have a market for that. Can you make it one day affordable? Can you make so simple, safe and affordable that we, we can be an answer for urban transportation? with the barriers somehow selecting the height of this bar today. With the embraer X on it all. With a combination of uh, artificial intelligence or, uh, or data processing and batteries to be challenged with the storage of energy. So just to finish it's up to us to select where we put our bar. We have the global challenges, we have technologies perfecting our goals, and we need to select the bar and start the game. Thank you. Was such a fascinating lecture. Oh, a piece of what we just did. <laughs> so here, ICAST would like to appreciate uh, our um, speaker here and hang over this. Uh, it's a uh, uh, ICAST Daniel and Florence Guggenheim Award certificate, and it's in recognition of a lifetime career with outstanding contribution to safe and lean process in aircraft development. Thank you so much. So, uh, do we have any announcement, uh, Axel? Uh, no announcement? Then um, I guess uh, we're having our first uh, coffee break, and I hope you can enjoy this coffee break and take advantage of this opportunity to socialize and network with all the experts from around the world. Thank you again. <laughs>